It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. <laughs> I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> I like that. That's like the Riley Shuffle. <laughs> oh, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, who's that guy? <laughs> hey, everybody. Woo. Welcome to episode 44 of Bigfoot Collectors Club, the show where amazing guests share their personal paranormal histories, and we tell tales of high strangeness. There's nothing funny about that. I'm your host, Michael McMillan with me always is your other host Bryce Johnson and our trusty producer Riley Bray and uh, we were just talking before the show uh, sort of launched into this recording session um, mm -hmm. like a lackluster SpaceX flight <laughs> we had a little trouble getting started uh, this is the guys we're on episode 44 and I think this is officially the longest relationship I've ever been in That's we're amazing. coming up on a year that's amazing man well I'm gonna get you a nice uh, anniversary ring. What is the f what is the first year? You ever go like I've been married 15 years, mm -hmm. and you always check the internet like third year anniversary, and it's like twine. <laughs> oh, you yeah, like first, oh, first paper, right, I couple think. Or right, paper, oh, right, yeah, there you go, so, or something like that. But we'll have um, to figure what that is. You just heard his voice, and he'll have many more answers no, for me. us today. I spoke uh, too soon. <laughs> no, no, please, <laughs> you can't. I just want to give you an introduction and get you in here. Jump the gun a little. Uh, bit. Today. <laughs> Better than being behind the gun, like <laughs> yeah. no, I've yeah. been from the moment I woke up this morning. <laughs> with us today is an actor that I occasionally cross paths with on the set of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and he's also starring in a brand new show on Hulu called The Body. Nice. Ooh. Yeah, sounds sexy. Thank you. Uh, everyone, please give a warm welcome <laughs> to David Hull. Yeah. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Awesome. <laughs> Welcome to our sad little club. <laughs> hey. Oh, this is sweet, man. What are you talking We're about? A sweet little club. Uh, yeah. David was one of the few cast members that was giving me a, a really hard time for not uh, bringing him on the show yeah, yet. Yeah, I just thought it was a little bit insulting considering <laughs> that I have absolutely no reason to be a guest on this podcast. I have no stories yeah. of the paranormal. I have no expertise of any kind. We'll see. I got shit the most from you and Vela. Yeah, it was mostly a bit. I didn't think in a million years you'd actually ask me to do this, but here I am. And, yeah, and then uh, Vela's like, I don't have any stories. I was like, god damn it. I, I, I've i always wanted to have more cast members on. I was kind of saving it for the return. You were Gabrielle Ruiz before you got to meet Jesus. Well, she, uh, her, she her, brought you, her story she was the, the funk. Heat. Holy cow. Dude, everyone yeah. except for, I think she and Donna Lynn have it covered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The cast. She basically and with Pete's wife having of her course. area of expertise. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. You guys really have hit the trifecta of crazy ex-girlfriend cast members. Totally. Without Pete and Susie, we would have never met uh, Dela Levine. Yeah. Our now resident oh. BCC medium psychic. I know. I want to Which, talk to we're her. We're going to get back stuff. on the show very soon. We need to. It's that yeah. spooky time of year. We need to. We need I think to Susie still back. sees her pretty regularly. I think she does. Oh yeah. No. And 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 uh, I think on the regs. Yeah. Like, Susie's treating me from afar. She's healing me. Oh. I have a, a disease called Meniere's disease. It's what is a, this? It's a it's a very uh, rare inner ear disease that causes it causes me to lose fifty percent of my hearing in my left ear, Whoa. and then creates these kind of manic uh, vertigo spirals for hours at a time. What? Oh, no. And so she did some healing in person on me, and then I ran into her uh, last week, and she told me, or she asked me if I'd been having any spirals. I was like, you know, it's crazy. I actually haven't, and it's because she's been healing me from afar. Wow. And I have to say, I felt the, the, the dawning, you know, the little twinge of it coming on, and then it disappears. Right, right away. And you said you That's had incredible. nothing to share with the club. Today. There you go. Yeah, I guess that is relevant. Well, wow, thank God I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> wait. So uh, I'm so sorry to hear that you suffer from this condition. Oh, that that sounds right. Like it sucks. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's not great. How I'm, is your hearing uh, now? I mean, not now, now, but I mean in general. I gotta say, I have noticed no actual change in what I can hear. But apparently, at certain frequencies, I mean, when they do all the sort of uh, really high tech sound test or a hearing test, I can't. I I just, am, I think I can hear fine. I hear like I always thought I could, but apparently at certain frequencies, I have extremely low sensitivity. So mm. you're like an anti-dog. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can't hear no, yeah, pitched. super high and super low. I I guess I have I have really poor oh, hearing. Wow. And the well, middle range. Or maybe it's the other way. I think I have high and low and I don't have the middle range. Oh, the speaking oh wow. Range. That's very just in my left. And my right's always been like thirty percent deaf. Really? Yeah. I'm so surprised to hear my, this. Yeah, from my childhood. What what and what caused that if I don't know. You know. It's just always been like I remember sitting in the hearing test in grade school. Did you have to do this? Oh yeah. yeah. And they you know, they set set you up and they say to raise whichever hand you hear the beep, uh, which in whichever corresponding ear you hear the beep. And uh, I was sitting down and I raised my hand and she was like, we haven't started yet. Um, <laughs> oh. It's when you hear the beep that you raise your hand. I was like, right. Yep. I, <laughs> I had totally just imagined a beep because I was so nervous of about course. hearing it. Uh, so I guess I... Turns out you've just been totally misdiagnosed because of raising your hand. <laughs> just a, you just have general anxiety disorder like the rest of us. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Right. You're just freaking out about all not being that. included. And is that how you got the nickname David No Beeps yep. Hall? <laughs> no Beeps Hall, everyone. Everyone's calling me that. God, thought I'd escaped it. Here we are. Sorry to bring it back. Your mom wrote us an email. Wow. Um, well, speaking of emails, yes. if I may, uh, I would like to uh, read a couple... Emails from our listener files. What yeah. a nice idea. It's a great idea, Mike. Thank you, David. Uh, you know, we do uh, the occasional listener files episodes, and we just want to make sure that you guys uh, get to enjoy them a little bit more frequently, because sometimes they're six to seven weeks apart. Well, and it really brings the uh, the fans into the show as part of the show, because, uh, you know, we love hearing and collecting uh, paranormal stories, whatever they may be. Exactly. And this might be a veiled advertisement for our new phone number. That you can call. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mm, We've got uh, a Bigfoot Collectors Club Paranormal Hotline. And that number is 310-597-4803. Leave us a voicemail. All right, so this one is from Jared. Oh, wait a moment. Oh. Let's cue a little music here. Sure. Oh, my goodness. Club listener files. All right. <laughs> All right. Wow. There we go. Here we go. I really enjoyed that. Here we go. Hi, guys. I'm Jared. I was born and raised in Roswell, New Mexico. But there you go. We could stop right there. Yep. <laughs> that's You're all weird. Need here. <laughs> yeah, that's all you need. I never had any experience of the paranormal until I moved to Georgia, where my wife is from. Before I moved out there, she warned me about how she thinks she's haunted. This was back in 2009. Since then, we have lived in four different houses and have experienced the same thing from items being moved in the house to hearing our voices being mimicked. That would suck. I do have an episode where I believe I was abducted. So, it begins about a year and a half ago between 12 and 2 in the morning. My wife was asleep next to me and I was watching TV. All of a sudden, I got this heaviness in my chest and I couldn't move or talk. I tried waking her up but couldn't. I then began to hear a humming sound, and then, in one foot, squares my ceiling started flashing like a dance floor, like some squares were on them and some were off. Then it stopped and got quiet. I was unable to move or speak, but then five humanoid figures walked through my closed bedroom door and stood around the foot of my bed. They were of average height and build, but the one in the center was only a little bit taller. I don't know if they had a cloaking device on because all they looked like to me was static on a TV screen. I don't remember falling asleep that night and woke up the next day feeling very not me. But yeah, that's what happened to me, Jared. Jared. Jared's wow. possessed, dude. Yeah. Jared, you need to see somebody about that. <laughs> or as Bryce likes to say, it's time to get regressed. <laughs> dude, I should, I should become a, a, a regressionist. I'm sure it's only like one or two classes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it's pretty yeah, much a, an online course right. you can take in an I'm hour. Sure I, I just, think it's just a self declaration. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Oh man, I, I just I can just imagine the late night TV commercial of Bryce. <laughs> Go get regress. I'm Bryce. Go get regress, Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Hi, Bryce. I'm calling. For get regress. <laughs> You're wearing <laughs> next like, collar. That's all John, you say. <laughs> John Lennon sunglasses <laughs> and a black turtleneck. <laughs> <laughs> It's time to get regressed, love. Half the fun of this podcast has just now become us imagining.
imagining <laughs> what Bryce's other jobs should be other than being an uh, actor. Try, I could use some. I gotta say that you. is not the costume I was envisioning, but oh I'm glad God. you said it. That's very, very <laughs> well, good. You know, this is a very interesting story. Um, I'm hung up on the dance floor. Yeah, the, 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 the lights the and the tiles of the, the ceiling. Michael Jackson video. That um, is a, such a cool detail. Yeah, yeah, that's kooky. I wonder if it's something like the energy coming down from these beings was sort of like rippling yeah. like like sort of like when you're walking across no it was you the know, ceiling a, it was the ceiling oh it was the ceiling yeah like a like an illuminated tiled dance floor oh, go, some going whoa. on and off but you know there's some very commonalities here in the uh in, in the common abduction story w- one is that you know that heaviness in the chest uh another one is being these beings being able to move through walls windows doors um also uh the one being a little taller than the other ones, you know, usually they see that back on the ship, you know, we must sound like crazy people, but, uh, <laughs> Hey, you know, but no, like sometimes, I mean, in, in a lot of the abductions when they're on the, uh, you know, if they're on a table or something, they'll see, you know, a few small humanoid figures and there's always, there's always uh, one taller leader. That's right. That seems to be either commanding or instructing other drones or smaller uh, entities on yeah. ships, or not being able to wake up the uh, the misses. That's another one. That's you another know. tried and true. That's like a Whitley Strieber <laughs> yeah. communion level uh, yeah. commonality, as you like. To oh say. my god, I just got that flash of like walking Christopher Walken waking up. What? Like when he's like going <laughs> when going crazy in front of them. He's like playing with them. It was so crazy. Have you ever seen Communion? No, David? your references are well outside of my of, of my well, uh, ability to comprehend. We watched it on a movie night i hadn't seen it before either but uh um... it's a 1989 film i believe yeah. uh starring christopher walken where he plays whitley streber uh based on whitley streber's book about his abduction experience up in the catskill mountains oh, and christopher walken is like at his peak does he play movie. a man recalling an abduction or does he play the man encountering but a little bit oh, of both he, yeah yeah he you see him go through the hypno regression wow. and re-experience it and it's such a delicious, like uh, late eighties Chris Walken. Walken. Was classic. Yeah, it's a weird and it's a weird movie, uh, and we expected to not love it as much as we did. And you know, it's perfect int- for this time of year, guys. If you want to watch a spooky movie, see, I wasn't imagining a- an alien encounter when I heard that. Mm. I What's was, your interpretation? I was imagining something more paranormal, something more from from another realm. Sure, not, not quite. Uh, but but I guess. Well, it says static people. I've never come across that, like TV static, and you know that's that's new. I've never heard yeah. or or read anything about that. Why don't you read the next email, Bryce? Yeah, very oh, interesting. This one is from oh, Matt, man. and uh, he says, "Hey, Mike and Bryce, huge fan of the podcast. I listen to it every morning on my way back to work. Uh, I found you guys through my wife, actually." She knows I'm writing my comic book and saw Michael post about Adventure Van, which is sick, by the way. Oh, thanks, man. <clears throat> hey, nice little plug for Adventure Van. A new told- comic book out now. <laughs> I did not plan that. I'm like, wait. I mean, you picked these <laughs> to be read. This uh, email. That's why, not why I picked you, this one. Why is that in a different font? <laughs> and told me I should check out what Michael's been up to. It turns out Mr. McMillan is some is into some awesome things. Okay. And now I'm hooked. Now we can skip all this. He's <laughs> also very <laughs> handsome and yeah. talented. <laughs> he smells great. He smells Smells great. <laughs> my story. I was probably around 11 or 12. My friend was sleeping over at my house, and as kids tend to do, we stayed up way too late and were cracking each other up. After about the third or fourth time my mom barged in telling us to go to sleep, we wrapped it up and hopped aboard the Dreamland Express. My room was laid out in a way where you could fit another mattress on the floor next to my bed. If I had to guess, we were asleep for a few hours, so maybe around 3 or 4 a.m., I the fe- hour of high strangeness totally. comes up again and again. It's that window. Uh, I felt a finger, hopefully, poking hopefully. me in the side. Where's your, where's Where your are friend? we headed? Where are we headed? <laughs> I know. Where's your friend? <laughs> I know. I waved my hand away and said something like, go back to bed or go back to sleep, Dillhole. After a few more pokes yeah, to the side, Dillhole. I rolled over in a fit of rage thinking my friend was messing with me. I turned to see a man entirely made of white noise. I've never experienced anything like this before or since. All I remember happening next was it reaching for me and then nothing. I woke up the next morning as if nothing happened. I casually told my friend about it over breakfast like, hey, bud, did you happen to see a full-grown man made of static walking around last night? He said no. I thought to myself, 
great, I'm insane now. <laughs> After this experience, all of the logic I apply to my daily life tells me, Matt, it was a dream. But you have to wonder, if we live in a multiverse with many, many spatial dimensions, with an infinite amount of possible situations, who's to say I didn't come across an interdimensional poker guy? Me, that's who. Anyway, <laughs> that's, a great email. that's my story. It's become kind of an urban legend in my friends group. The Static Man. Keep up the great work, guys. Matt. Matt. Doesn't wow. sound unlike how Jared referred to those five exactly. figures at the foot yeah. of his bed. Yeah, you coupled crazy, those nicely together. Yeah, I think Riley well, they, was the first one to spot these emails. Yeah, they then, coupled themselves. They came in one right after the they other. They were back to back. They yes. came in Arr. like a day apart. That's wild. Isn't that, that insane? Is wild. So that's why I picked those two. And, and I also want also for the gratuitous I Michael. Mean, yeah. <laughs> that just <laughs> happened to be in there. <laughs> sure. I that's can't wild. control what people put in these emails. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I also like that he's an interdimensional poker guy. Like he's not as in a poker player. Yeah, he no, like I, to walk around I imagined cards when he said <laughs> I yeah. got there eventually. Yeah, I, did. But... I did too, right. Totally. I was thinking cards. You Card. know, I'm starting to think more about this this window this 3 a.m window and and how everybody seems to be you know in their room or in their bed god that doesn't even you know now i'm starting to think about all the uh the abductions that take place and people driving in their car mm -hmm. sometimes even in the daylight hours but um perhaps there's something in that window where you're close to rem sleep and they you know the the DMT is releasing, you know, from the pineal gland to, to kind of and spur that and from your brain, which, you know, they think is what uh, releases sometimes during, you know, deep hypnagogic sleep, REM sleep or whatever, which might And release some... during birth and birth death, Birth and death, right? yeah, which is the strange times of, uh, you know, and that's all from uh, Rick Strassman's book, DMT, mm -hmm. The Spirit Molecule. It's a good but... book. Have you ever read that? I David? haven't. I was just going to reference Michael Pollan's book on psychedelic drugs because... Mm. He talks about this constrictor that our brain applies as we grow older mm. that helps us weed out irrelevant information. Right. And by I think ours are broken. <laughs> <laughs> <They> must, <yeah. laughs> but just in terms of just seeing a face and instead of trying to process all the information, you immediately know it's a face. You just have to figure out which face it is. But your brain is getting inundated with information constantly and you have this constrictor that's helping you weed out the information that's not helpful in just your day-to-day -day activities. Right. But in uh, very young children, in deep REM sleep, and on psychedelic drugs, it that releases that constrictor. So mm. you could also just be m more open to receiving that information that could sure. be around you all the time. Absolutely. I mean, and perhaps these dimensions are accessed within us as opposed to outside of us. Right. You know, or um, just being able to see it clearly because you're open to receiving right. the information yeah, that absolutely. your brain has chosen. That's to what I, th I, I tend to lean towards that, that it's sort of like you're just... Tuning a radio Yeah, dial. you're opening up the aperture on that lens and seeing, uh, letting a little bit more light and a little bit more frequency mm. into your... I guess third eye is the appropriate yeah, term. Yeah. term. And you what's know, the DMT mm, book that you were just talking? about? It's uh, the Spirit Molecule, I think, by Rick Strassman. And we have it. Yeah, on he is a. Uh, he was an Arizona right next, to, right next to the English Book of Magic. Down he there. was, uh, I believe, an yeah. Ar Arizona Arizona State professor, and it was the first kind of government uh, licensed study on uh, on on psychedelic mm. drugs. You know. Uh, over the past 50 years and what he found was you know so he was injecting people with um with doses of dmt that i think he got from rats brains mm -hmm. oh um, delicious something like that but uh but what he found was the w what kind of blew his mind was the commonalities in the experiencers usage what they yeah. what they described going into other dimensions and 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 coming in contact with intelligences there right. uh, outside of their own ego outside of their own mind and awareness um, you know some would relate them to kind of like almost godlike some would just relate them to almost alien entities but yeah. uh, yep. but the commonalities ran through all of his patient studies and and he was really kind of baffled and befuddled and and it really kind of drove him to you know coin the term the spirit molecule um, yeah, it's a very interesting I don't know. Read. I wonder what the uh, similarity is between DMT and um, psilocybin. 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 Well, Terrence McKenna will describe the differences between the actual experiences of 
of of using uh, psilocybin mushrooms and the experience. And Graham Hancock does a great job too in su- in the book Supernatural of describing the differences of the experience. Apparently, I mean, you know, DMT is like hyperdrive. I mean, when you inject or or smoke that, according to these guys, I mean, you are you are launched into a into a, another realm, another world. And it's Ooh. for like eight minutes, as opposed to oh, psilocybin, which I is see. like in your. Um, <clears throat> I he it's talks a very so much abstract of, eight minutes though. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, it's I a, see. Would you like to share with the class? I mean, I think maybe another time. But, sure. Um, <laughs> I I very much relate to that book. Yeah. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, it's uh. Seems like a little I always, bit of a always... necessary tease, but when you're ready to tell that story, <laughs> yeah, no, it no, it, it, it makes you it makes you listen. I mean, if 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 we're if explorers of the unknown, at some point in in my life, I've always felt like I wanted to travel that roadway again at some point. I mean, I've had my experiences with, with mushrooms and psilocybin, but, and they were all pretty profound and, and deep. And, you know, I have a, a vast respect for, yeah. for them, but I've, I've never, you Michael know. Paul and stances sort of don't really do it until you're 50, until you're 50 or 60 and right. can, and have this wealth of, of information as a grown person and not as a developing person. Yeah. When it can, more resemble recreation and yeah. just you know tripping balls or whatever. Totally. Right. Yeah. No, it would I would I would you'd have to like respect the experience and go right. into it uh looking to bring something back, you know what I mean, instead of just, you know. It is funny to think about how specifically our egos function because obviously it's survival mechanism and you have to put yourself first so that you can eat and procreate and you know all the things that humans have to do to survive. But because of that, we have these pretty narrow blinders on, and mm-hmm. then coupled with the fact that we live in these sort of very specific socialized structures, that it, to zoom out, to really let your brain zoom out is terrifying. So I understand people referencing bad trips and things because it can be really daunting. Yeah. But I think if you can respect it and open your brain to it, it could be very enlightening everyone everyone describes it though. well yeah. and when you add on the uh social uh programming that you experience from different cultures right right like drugs are bad which right, exactly. you know they can be very destructive obviously again we talk about this stuff we're not saying run out and do this stuff but that and then if you come up from a uh, christian upbringing and right. you're like hearing you're like oh my gosh what if i'm in hell and mm. what if i'm in you can easily interpret it, interpret things in sort of a from a cultural point of view that may or may not be helpful right and death um, is scary and, conf- and paranormal yes. activity is evil and yeah, right absolutely uh, yeah. aliens are bad you know for right. the most part that kind of stuff but um they were bad in Independence Day. They're very bad. <laughs> yeah, totally. Very bad. E.T. <laughs> E.T. Very good. Well, that's very. why I'd be so like interested to kind of kind of discover my experience of it because my ide- ideology has been kind of uh, broken open and 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 kind of like spread across spread across all the realms. So it's like you know I'm into like you know. Um, all kinds of like, you know, uh, spirits and demons, aliens, ghosts, parent. I mean, so who knows where it would land, you know, with right, me. Um, right. Um, it'd be interesting he to He was find even, out. this is such a side item, feel free to cut this, but he was talking about mushrooms specifically and mm-hmm. how they function as organisms. And even just hearing him describe them required me to really let go of my previous information, which is it's a single thing that I can eat and it can poison me and that can cause my brain to do things. But it's basically the internet of the forest. Yeah. yeah and the right. largest living organisms the largest on, living the, planet organism on the planet. It's that's crazy right. crazy to me. Yep. It's insane. And they can com- they can communicate between one side and another of just uh, within their themselves. Yeah. And then they can communicate between other Fungal living things and... and trees and grasses that are growing and latched into their root systems. Yeah, that's these, exactly like, right. I can't remember mycelia. My, is that mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I think so, yeah. That's this, you know, kind of uh, fiber optic y kind of network. It's like the internet. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's really uh, insane to think that we would, <laughs> you know, that we as people and as culture, especially Western culture, just sort of ignore all that. Ignore like right. the perfectionism that right. the per- perfect entity. And no, and we watch that Avatar and we're like, ooh, nature. what a fun. That's yeah, a fun concept. Yeah, and yeah. Like, <laughs> that's, that's, we that's could a, be us. entirely in reality. Yeah. And yeah. instead, we're just 
decimating yep. decimating yep. nature it's insane it's crazy well um so it's a great environmentalist yeah, podcast yeah. thank you for having me mm-hmm. yeah. david uh you seem very open minded and oh, uh you, even though you don't uh necessarily <laughs> have specific stuff mm-hmm. i think we'll be able to dig in a little bit mm-hmm. here no i'm desperate for a ghost okay, to haunt great. me i've been begging i'm i welcome it if any ghosts are listening please haunt me okay well we're going <laughs> to ask you what is your personal paranormal history you know, I'm sure if I were more open to it at a younger age, I could have something to reference. I just, uh, I just didn't. I don't think I've had anything. Well, where did you grow up? First of all, Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. And do you remember any? Uh, were there any urban legends or folk tales of things in your town growing up in Cincinnati? Was there like? The UFO that's made it into the local paper kind or the haunted not. house in the neighborhood. Really not, no. Yeah. I, I think part of it is that it, it is, a um, got to be careful here, but there there are, it's not a particularly open-minded right. area that I was from. So I, uh, as we were saying before, that all just kind of sounds evil and scary. So right. it just really wasn't the uh, preoccupation of anyone that I knew, no one in my family. When I got to New York, I lived in New York for a while, and I did theater, and those theaters are all legendarily haunted. Exactly. And I mean, that was my I've had so many people next question. tell... There was this uh, show that I did at the Al Hirschfeld Theater, it's called now. I don't remember what it used to be called, but uh, there's apparently a little girl who haunts one of the aisles, and she walks up and down that aisle, and I can't tell you how many people have told me that they've seen her, and they've all described a similar dress, they've all described a similar height, they've all, uh, I think... Some of them unknowing of other people who have told the same story, referencing this thing. But I, I like walking through the aisles in the dead of night, praying that she would come to me. <laughs> yeah, and she refused me. Yeah, how does that make you feel? Yeah, boy, <laughs> even ghosts won't haunt. Me. <laughs> but did you, as a child growing up, were you ever infatuated with horror movies or what scared like Again, what scared my you? good Christian upbringing forbade that okay uh, but I liked I mean I liked haunted houses I liked the the kind of camp of right. scare tactic and the performance aspect of it but I I just didn't really ever I never really thought about what it. Uh, if I'm, I may ask which what denomination were you raised Southern Baptist oh wow mm. okay what's that like? Uh, You're speaking to a Presbyterian. Yeah, sure. So extraordinarily conservative, just, uh, you know, much more conservative. But it was like a part gospel church, Uh part uh, good Christian values church. Any fire and brimstone? No, no, no. No, no. No, no, even like the devil's out to get you. Oh, well, yeah, all of that. All right. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, all the the kind of standard, uh, the standard apocalypse. Ooh. Forthcoming, make sure you're in the right camp before that happens, oh. kind of thing. But not in a not in the sort of uh, uh, theatrical way that I, you see. Depicted. Right? Mm-hmm. Was Armand- it's definitely the through line? Were you? Was your church? Did your church preach that like the second coming was gonna happen Imminent. in this lifetime? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. And how was that? How did that affect your imagination <clears throat> growing up? Yeah, I guess I had a I had narrow. M- more narrow confines than I think I had realized because so much of my upbringing was rooted in that and so much of my value system was rooted in that and so much of my thought about the world around me was rooted in that and like a pretty precise good and evil and a pretty precise to speak uh, about ego again like we were talking about but from our viewpoint as us being the right ones and everyone right. else being wrong, <laughs> right, like, right. Pure, pure ego. But you know, there was nothing beyond that that really uh, entered into my even periphery. Wow, fascinating. Do you think it was limited because of? Did you do you feel like it sounds like you're pretty sheltered? Yes, yeah. growing up. Yep. Like, yeah. No, we weren't allowed to play secular music. Wow, I had no Whoa. idea. You even were... this is good. Fantasia is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. Fanta- Fantasia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I because got of nine on Bald Mountain. There's sorcery in Fantasia, right? Out of my depth here on this one. Okay, but, go on. Fantasia, it's an animated film yes. starring a wizard played by Mickey Mouse. <laughs> right. <laughs> Basically, yes. Uh, and uh, I got it for my, I don't know, eighth birthday or ninth birthday or something from my aunt, and my mom made me take it back on account of the wizardry. Wow. Oh, wow. 
Well, it so, wasn't that good. It was one of the only films I walked out of when I was young. I was what? like, yeah, I was expecting something else. I was like, sort of is... non-narrative. From yeah, yeah, it's yeah. classical music. It's basically like early <laughs> classical music videos, but it's beautiful. Yeah, well, I walked um, out. Yeah. and there's like a badass. <laughs> there's also a scene called Dragon. Dragon Bald Mountain. There's a badass like devil that like appears over this giant mountain Not and my like, house. makes ghosts dance in the palm of his hands. Mm. Um, wow, that's dark. Yeah, it it is actually, it's one of the darker moments in Disney animation. I remember the early one, I mean, Dumbo and Pinocchio and all of them have these really dark dream sequences. Oh, yeah. You know, it's funny because Disney was um, super religious Midwestern himself, brought up very by like a Bible-beating yeah. uh, salt-of-the-earth father. And so... He had sort of those values, in quotation marks, implanted in him. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then also, he was obsessed with the macabre. Like, there are lots of, like, there's that dancing skeleton uh, black and white short that he did. There's Night in Bald Mountain. There's some, like, really weird, dark stuff that he was was definitely into, which was really fascinating. Always fascinating. There is a little out there. There's a, I think that's an easy way for the pendulum to swing with the Christian upbringing because you spend so much time talking about evil. You spend so much time talking about life after death. You spend so much time talking about the impending <clears throat> apocalypse. Right. That I think there is, it is sort of, ro- it's rooted in you to obsess about it. Right. But also to keep it at arm's it's, length. It just, it's just, for me, it's, I feel like it's the perfect recipe for repression you know like i remember it is, yeah because i my upbringing was not that strict but we definitely you know we had to go to church every sunday yep. and i remember as a child i would i and this was also like oh maybe you had some anxiety issues going on but i remember laying awake in bed at night and i apologize to our listeners but uh <laughs> Uh, no, but I just remember laying it's awake. A masturbation. No, no, I wish. No, thank you. I'm glad you said it. I wish. I mean, I think some people will take offense to what I'm about to say, but I remember as a kid, th- I was like, the worst thing I could think is the phrase "fuck you, God." You right. know what I mean? Oh, yeah, sure. And then that would start playing on my in my head on loop. Yeah, wow. and I'd be. It would be like try not to think that, right. and then you would think that, and then I would think thinking that was gonna right. be really bad for me, and it was gonna mean that it was punishing. Then I'd be like, but God knows that I don't really mean this, and I would lay awake and just obsess Classic. over that, start crying. I couldn't sleep, yeah. and it's just like you know what? Just maybe this kid doesn't need to go to church. Maybe we can just <laughs> teach him right. moral values. Values to respect and love his neighbors, yeah. and it really you know, cracks open the psyche. You know, you become yeah. you become existential in a in a, in a certain aspect. Uh, it caused, I know the feeling. It caused a lot more problems for me than it did than it brought comfort. You know, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. But do do you still carry around any of that baggage? When did you kind of break out of that? Program? I shed a lot of that guilt uh, in my late twenties. Really? Yeah, yeah, it took me a while because we oh, it was a really we were a really strict household. My siblings are still pretty devout, um, and my my older brother's raising his children in very much the same way mm-hmm. that we were raised. And you know, it's hard it's hard because it seems like by saying that that isn't what worked for me, that isn't what offered me comfort, that isn't what gave me a good moral structure. It seems inherently judgmental. Of the people for whom it does work, which right. I don't mean it to be. And right. It seems like it does really work very well for my brother, and it seems like for he and his wife, that's how they'd like to raise their kids because it works so well for them. Right. But there, that lack of judgment doesn't go both ways because they judge me very much for for having left. Yeah. The whatever that is. The <laughs> yeah. That that narrow path. Wow. That's wild. That is wild. I mean, you've you've talked about it on the show too about kind of yeah. So my my upbringing, uh, you know, is I I got like both worlds. So my mom, like my parents were divorced when I was pretty young, and my mom was is was a was a Lutheran, which is like Catherine Light, but she was pretty devout and you know wanted us to go to church, and she definitely believes in 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 God and the hierarchy and the Bible and all that stuff. Whereas my dad was, you know, and I'd go to the summers and I would call it my deprogramming. He'd be like, all right, what are they teaching you in that school? <laughs> and I'm like, this and that. And, be like, and he would, you know, because he was an atheist through and through, uh-huh. um, which is like its own religion in, sure. in a sense. You know what sure, I mean? Yeah. He, like they're they're si- very serious about yeah, they're there being nothing. boundaries there. Yeah, narrow yeah. confines yeah. either way. Yeah. So it really kind of tore my 
my psyche apart. And just like you, staying uh, awake in bed at night, it really, you know, it, it, I guess I've just always wanted to know what the truth is or as close as I can come to it. Yep. So you really start to explore both sides and and then it really just cracks you open like an egg. You're like, well, this, maybe this is true yep. or maybe that's true. But uh, yeah. And it's asking you to have these really high minded existential conversations without with a doubt when you haven't even really figured out how to have the, the, narrow social structure conversations right. with right. yourself. Right. Like, so right. true. Dealing with these really abstract, yeah. uh, yeah. high-minded notions. Yeah, I, I think I guess the thing that I find I that must be for people who it really works for, and what I would wish in any type of religion that I would practice is that it it expands my universe. It expands my world. It expands my imagination. Mm. It, it expands my acceptance because to me, that's really the only model that I can understand of what a god or deity would be is some someone who really is truly enlightened that's like loves loves creation, loves existence, loves the mystery of life. And right. it's like, let's go on a kick-ass adventure into thinking about all this stuff and exploring. Let me ask you this, though. If, there, if there's this deity that loves all, can't a deity love evil as well? Oh, sure. I mean, or... or I, I, I uh, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I lo love in terms of like... I, I guess what I'm getting at, you know, because for isn't it the dark that shows us the light? And so, you know, it has to all kind of coexist together you know what i'm saying yeah i mean i know I, what you're saying though too it's you know joseph campbell said it the best uh while that may be true the the best thing that we can do is lean to the light well and and also too i think he also talked about how binary thinking is a real trap it is and it's a way to fall into literal thinking which is there's good and bad there's either or there's black and white well this is like right. we're talking about right. you have these sort of narrow blinders on mm -hmm. because it it does help for society it helps people live in a in in their lane right but in terms of all the information we're receiving from the world around us it isn't just that it, no, it couldn't be all. just no. that how could it right no it's like uh, to quote linda godfrey our guest from last week all this stuff kind of falls somewhere on a sliding scale yeah. you know and i think that we've uh we've fallen into a trap of looking at things as either or mm -hmm. you know i couldn't agree more um so i don't know but it's fascinating yeah. what would you be open to in terms of what's what 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 did what does capture imagination about the paranormal there's nothing that scares me about it okay there's absolute i'm so open to it i would welcome it if what? i saw some ghost i'd be like what's up man tell me everything right. okay right. i wouldn't run i wouldn't throw things i wouldn't you know that's why I think it is. I'm doing it as a bit, but I really am very, very open to it, <laughs> right. and it is extraordinarily disappointing hmm. that nothing that nothing has even arisen. A, even a static person at the foot yeah. of yeah. Oh, bed. I'd love it. Yeah, I'd love oh, it. Oh, come on, sit like, down. What's going on, static right. man? Right. Am right. I in your space? Right. <laughs> if I am, I'm yeah. happy to leave. Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I used to sit like you were saying, laying in bed, thinking about just your sort of moral boundaries, and then obsessing about it. I used to think and sort of uh, obsess over what it must feel like to die and be able to have those questions answered. Right. From a really young age, thinking about death in a very comfortable way, which I think has affected me as an adult too, because I, I never, death has never been this sort of looming, daunting horror at wow. the end of a long tunnel. It's always been a sort of it seems like a welcome relief, actually. Right. Well, you're young. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure that'll come at some point. But it's also affected my way of dealing with death uh, uh, of loved ones, of people close to me, because it just never really seems particularly sad. I mean, I understand the impulse to miss having someone around, mm -hmm. but I, I, it's kind of, I sort of envy them. God, it makes me want to... A past guest, Joe uh, Manganella, he Instagrammed Manganella, something... Sure, uh, sure. Uh, God, I gotta read it. Let me see if I can find it. But it was a quote from the the late great Stanley Kubrick, hmm. um, and it had very much to do with uh, with death. Oh, here it is. I'll read it right now. Um, I don't know why this is a little off tangent, but uh, I, I, I it's just a quote about filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I I think you'll like this. So Playboy asked. It was an interview from Playboy. And uh, Playboy asks... I also love that Joe posted something from Playboy. That <laughs> yeah. makes a lot of <laughs> yeah, sense. Yeah, sure. If Sounds life right. is so purposeless, do you feel that it's worth living? And Kubrick answers, yes, 
For those of us who manage somehow to cope with our mortality, the very meaninglessness of life forces man to create his own meaning. Children, of course, begin life with an untarnished sense of wonder, a capacity to experience total joy at something as simple as the greenness of a leaf. But as they grow older, the awareness of death and decay begins to impinge on their consciousness and subtly erode their joie de vivre, their idealism, and their assumption of immortality. As a child matures, he sees death and pain everywhere about him and begins to lose faith in the ultimate goodness of man. But if he's reasonably strong and lucky, he can emerge from this twilight of the soul into a rebirth of life's, uh, life's elan. Both because of and in spite of his awareness of the meaninglessness of life, he can forge a fresh sense of purpose and affirmation. He may not recapture the same pure sense of wonder he was born with, but he can shape something far more enduring and sustaining. The most terrifying fact about the universe is not that it is hostile, but that it is indifferent. But if we can come to terms with this indifference and accept the challenges of life within the boundaries of death, however mutable man may be able to make them, our existence as a species can have genuine meaning and fulfillment. However vast the darkness, we must supply our own light. That was all on an Instagram post? <laughs> Boy, that was yeah. a long quote. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was. But I... I How do you squeeze all that? <laughs> <laughs> you got to really zoom in. It was, yeah, it was, it was a it's tiny a very read. Fine it was a tiny print. read. But uh, I think that was apropos about no, what we were talking about. No, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, completely. And, there, and also uh, brought up as well, to bring in full circle, the... Uh, the wonderment of being a small kid, which and and having your yeah. eyes open to everything that the spectrum has to yeah. yes, before you've applied yeah. that constrictor. Yeah. yeah. Whatever that's called, I wish I knew the name of it. Well, you know what? We'll call it David David Hole <laughs> Constriction. The constrictor. <laughs> Guys, I yeah. got a piece so bad. I'm so All right, sorry. great. You know no, what? Yeah, it's perfect time break. to take a break when we come back. Uh we'll play a little game with you and then we'll uh move on to this week's tale of high strangeness. Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> And we're back with David Hall. Yes, good afternoon. Star of H. <laughs> I guess I don't know when they're listening. Almost at HBO's Hulu's mm. new show, mm. The Body. Which Are is... you the body, David? I'm or... not. Okay. I am not, although <laughs> my mother <laughs> thought that I was. As if I had asked her to watch something I had done where I played just a dead corpse that gets dragged <laughs> around. That's the, the premise of the gotcha. movie, is that a dead corpse gets dragged around for two hours. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's Halloween, so no one, everyone just thinks it's a prop. Oh, gotcha. right. interesting. And so she's like, I didn't realize you had such a big part. <laughs> oh. I was thinking like right. like body, like Jesse the Body Ventura, oh, no. somebody who's in great shape. No, no. nor was I that excellent body. Excellent shape. Gotcha. Okay. I was neither body. Gotcha. That is hilarious. <laughs> well, we can't see your face, but you're so good in this. <laughs> You are a major character. <laughs> the titular character. You are. Oh, my God. <laughs> integral to the plot. All right, so this is a game we call Bullshit or Believe It. It's rapid fire. Can't wait. We. Uh, I'm going to list the things. Bullshit. That you make. Bullshit. <laughs> Great. So you, you say bullshit it. or believe it. He gets the concept. <laughs> yeah. Got it? Bullshit. On your mark. Mm-hmm. Get set. Ghosts. Bullshit. Ghosts. Oh, believe it. UFOs. Believe it. Bigfoot. Bullshit. Angels. Bullshit. Gnomes. Bullshit. Fairies. Bullshit. Unicorns. Bullshit. Loch Ness Monster. Believe it. Alien Greys. Believe it. Parallel Universes. Believe it. Reptilians disguising themselves as humans. Bullshit. Mermaids. Bullshit. Heaven. Bullshit. Hell. Bullshit. Dogmen. Hmm. Hadn't really thought about it. (laughs) Uh, Instinct is bullshit. (laughs) It would Go be, with your gut. and then wait till you hear about Dogman, Yeti, <laughs> bullshit, elves, bullshit, ESP, believe it, Chupacabra, bullshit, demons, bullshit, Atlantis, like the lost continent of Atlantis from uh, mythology. Yeah. Oh God, I don't know. I don't know it that well. I'm gonna go bullshit. <laughs> Time travel. Oh, God, isn't that just a construct of the mind? I don't know. I think I believe it. I mean, I believe that there's a way to do that. Life on other planets. You're not asking me to expand on these? <laughs> we'll come back. <laughs> you said rapid fire. I have more to say. Life on, we'll come back. <laughs> Life on other planets. Sure, yeah, believe it. Life after death. 
bullshit. Okay. Whoa. All I was, right. I was, cool. I was surprised. I got some questions in here. Well, my my life after death bullshit is is more like life as we know it after death. If yeah. you know right. what I mean. Like, does my spirit in my form go somewhere and is continue David to Holmes Does your personality chilling, survive? Yeah. Yeah. No, but I I believe in energetic transfer, and I believe that our energy and our matter cannot be created or destroyed. That's right. So we must exist in some capacity. Great. Awesome. Um, well, I, li- I liked your answers. I was I was glad to hear you. Uh, you had some belief in some of those there. Atlantis. <laughs> <Yeah>. Atlantis. <laughs> pretty pretty uh, straight bullshit. I guess I feel for... better about myself. <laughs> yeah. Atlantis struggled with a little bit. Because I'm a mermaid man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm a mermaid man. That's another t-shirt. I'm a mermaid uh, man. Yeah. At le- I just Self-made. <laughs> self-mermaid man. <laughs> self-made mermaid man. <laughs> I'm not a. Uh, I'm not familiar enough with the mythological tale of Atlantis. Aside from that, it's well, a, a it, lost. Concept. Yeah, it was mentioned in uh, in Plato's writing, and mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. where else? Ed, the famous uh, sleeping prophet Edgar Casey uh, described uh, the lost city of Atlantis. Mm-hmm. And as the story goes, it was kind of like it was. Uh, it was destroyed. Their technology overpowered their their civilization, and 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 they were thrust into a cataclysmic deluge. Kind of like and, uh, uh, Noah's flood times like a thousand, right? Right, but As if so, a civ- uh, like super advanced civilization had totally sort of brought upon their own destruction, yeah, oh, and, I uh, see. and a few of the high priests uh, managed to escape, and uh, and from there came up uh, to the deserts uh, of. Uh, Where's Egypt? Egypt? Yeah, is that Africa? Africa. I was going to say that sounded wrong, though. Uh, but anyway, and uh, and created the mystery schools of the Atlantean mystery schools, where some of the Egyptian high priests uh, became initiated, and uh, on and on it goes. But, and so there is a there is a an underwater land somewhere. Yeah, yeah. There's a well. There's. Not- with mermen, necessarily. No, no, not but, right. But yes, not I alive. think that you underneath could find... the Atlant- they underneath the Atlantic oh. uh, or something like that, you would be able to find um, remnants of the uh, the ancient city. I guess I have no real reason to disbelieve that. But you know, they found remnants of who knows if it's Such in the Atlantic too. <laughs> Did, I mean, there's all kinds of underwater uh, mega structures too. Like, what's the one in Japan? Well, the Yo- sea levels Yo- have risen. Yonaguni so... or something like that. Uh, oh yeah. Hey, uh, Graham Hancock has done a whole new book on uh, on underwater mm-hmm. structures and and uh, and monuments. I have a follow up question mm. about uh, their technological advancements that mm. then wreaked havoc on themselves. How did that include sea level? Uh, well, it was it was uh, it was thr- some say, some say it was a volcanic eruption that. Uh, uh, oh, sunk them. That sunk them. Oh, yeah, the, the entire city or was... Or an explosion. Or an explosion or a meteor or something like that. Yeah, well, that uh, certainly could, could uh, have happened. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Or some sort of... But it was a water city. Weapon it was of like, mass uh, destruction. Totally. But two high up. priests escaped. Um, uh, a, a major, uh, like a, a lot of... Oh, them, several like, Several, priests. Until yeah. two wacky high priests <laughs> taught them how to dance. <laughs> fall on CBS. <laughs> That's the really condensed, sloppy version, but yes. All right. Yeah, I have no. I I have a second follow up question. Does it have a? Does that story have a moral implication? Do, is there a? Is there a reason for that story having been told? Oh, it's it's a it's a great question. I don't know. I th- I think uh, what comes to mind is one has to be aware of how fast technology progresses when our spirituality uh-huh. lags behind. You know, or that you know a warning to civilizations of like civilizations rise and they fall. Nothing is forever. The reason I ask is because a lot of tales with a moral, sort of a moral compass reading Mm -hmm. have existed through so many societies because they're relevant stories that teach relevant lessons and then over time become these more literal, um, uh, these literal products of people's imaginations. Yeah. So they become less figurative stories that teach lessons and more precise little yeah. things that may have actually happened right it's, no it's interesting to think about uh, um i know um in in plato's writing he took it as literal literal fact that this this that there was this civilization and that this city existed how long before plato was this supposed to I have think happened? even Th- thousands thousands of years, of years yeah we'll look into it if some we research to do, to do. Mm-hmm. yeah we do too okay uh we're gonna take a very brief break and when we come back it's time for high strangeness Okay, guys, 
This story is one that I chose because it not only embraces everything we enjoy on this program, but also because it's a little badass and it's appropriately Halloween-y. Um, maybe one of the more far-fetched cryptids we've uh, ever examined here on the show, but <laughs> it's included in uh, Linda Godfrey's book, American Monsters, which is what inspired me to uh, pick it this, this week. This is the story of Bat Squatch. Yeah. Bat Squatch. Believe it. <laughs> oh, wait, yeah. On May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted, rocking the state of Washington in the largest volcanic event in U.S. history. The explosion shot 80,000 feet into the air, shaved off a side of the volcano, and caused the largest landslide in, landslide in recorded history. In addition to killing 57 people and thousands of animals and spreading ash across 11 states, the eruption may have kicked the door wide open to something unearthly. A giant flying hominid that would come to be known to locals as the Bat Squatch. Legend tells, and I want to emphasize the word legend here because I could find no eyewitness accounts of this specific cryptid before 1990. But according to local legend, folks started witnessing a strange, hulking creature with leathery, leathery type bat wings flying around Washington State not too long after the eruption. Mm. Now, our listeners know that this is the uh, <clears throat> this isn't the first time a shadowy ringed, winged creature would be linked to a local disaster. Sure, I'm speaking, of course, of the Mothman, Mothman who was mm. spotted in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, around the time that the Silver Bridge collapsed on December 15th, 1967, killing, uh, leading to the deaths of 46 people. Also, a hulking creature with large yep. muscles hung out around an old TNT plant. Let's go to the same gym. But the creature ruling the skies of Washington State was no moth, and it definitely was no man. <laughs> Hell yeah. If legends are true, and this monster was indeed seen in, the passing, in, uh, in passing glances by locals beginning uh, after the eruption of Mount St. Helens, no one would get a real good look at it until 1994. And that unlucky witness was a teenager by the name of Brian Canfield. On April 16th, 1994, Saturday night, Brian was driving in his pickup to his home in the rural community of Camp One near Mount Rainier, Washington. Now that name, Mount Rainier, should set off a few bells for our listeners who remember our Kenneth Arnold story from a few weeks back. Sure. One of the very first modern flying saucer uh, uh, witness accounts happened over Mount Rainier, mm. Washington. So this is an area of the country that has a lot of paranormal activity. This is Mount St. Helens. Well, the, the, the eruption is Mount St. Yeah. Helens. This story takes place near Mount Rainier, which is in Washington. How State. long after Mount St. Helens eruption? 14 are we years. Now? Okay. 14 years. That was in 1980. But l- there, if you look now about the Bass. Bat Squatch, they say that people had been seeing something like this since 1980. Now, where these eyewitness accounts are, I don't know. But Brian Canfield. But we got Brian Canfield, uh, and we're going to get into that. Okay. So, um, according to an article written by C.R. Roberts from the Tacoma News Tribune, uh, published a week after this uh, event, David was driving along. Oh, sorry, Brian. I think I wrote David because I was thinking of David Hull. Let's use um, David as the, David, as the witness. David, you can play Brian in this. Scenario. Oh my Everyone god, what an honor! Thank you. <laughs> Brian was driving along a forested road when his pickup engine cut out, and the vehicle came to a complete and sudden stop in the middle of the road. "Quote between the edge of the forest." And a clear-cut, scrubby field. That's from the report from the uh, the News Tribune. Assuming it was the result of a bad carburetor that had been bugging him all that week. Dang thing. Brian was about to get out and take a look at the engine when something truly batshit crazy happened. Descending straight into the spotlight of his truck headlamps came a large, winged creature. 
The monster landed with a whomp 30 feet from Brian's truck and turned towards the kid who was white knuckling the steering wheel of his dead truck as he gawked at the inhuman oddity. As the monster folded its wings back and turned away from the truck, Brian Brian started to get a good look at what he was facing. The monster was nine feet tall, Mm. with blue fur, yellow eyes. (laughs) I have a little helper here by the name of by the name of Nova, who just cleared my computer screen. (laughs) Uh, He was nine feet tall, blue fur, yellow eyes, tufted ears, broad shoulders, and a muscled human-like torso with clawed feet. Brian told the reporter this. It was standing there, staring at me like it was resting, like it didn't know what to think. I was scared. I felt the hair raise on me. I I didn't feel threatened. I I just felt out of place. It went on. Its eyes were yellow and shaped like a piece of pie with half moons for pupils. The mouth was pretty big. White teeth. No fangs. But the face was like a wolf. After several otherworldly minutes, Brian said the creature looked back at me and started flapping its wings. The wingspan, he said, was easily the width of the road. The monster lifted back into the air slowly, rocking the truck back and forth in its wake. And then the monster disappeared into the night sky. According to his interview with the News Tribune, Brian's truck suddenly started working again. He sped home, woke his parents, and told them what had happened. Both parents vouched for their son, saying that his hair was, quote, still standing on end when he told them the story. Brian's mom uh, made him draw a picture of the creature, and the family grabbed a neighbor who was familiar with the woods and a shotgun and headed back to the spot where Brian had seen the creature. Those are some pretty believable parents. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got to love them for that. Yeah, they like totally I mean, according you can and you can go find the uh, original article is out there. You can read it and they were like 100% supportive of their son. Love that. Um here's a gun. Yeah. Let's get the gun. Actually, he told his dad, "We got to get the shotgun. There's something out there." But of course, the monster did not make a return appearance that night. Brian went to school the next day and started sharing his exciting story. And of course, he got made fun of a lot, but also he had a few close buddies that believed him. And that's when Brian coined the term, the name, Bat Squatch, to describe to describe this hulking beast with wings. I see what he did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. About the size half of a big foot. Squatch. I yeah. see. You put them together. I see, it's Brian. It's not too shabby if I say so myself. Okay, mm-hmm. Brian. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the um, C.R. Roberts, the reporter, he believed him as well in the article. He said, uh, this kid really seemed to believe that he saw what he saw. And this also took place on the heels of the late 80s and early 90s satanic panic that was taking place, where communities, uh, and especially Christian communities, were becoming very scared of the influence of heavy metal and Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. Um, This is around the time of the West Memphis 3 case and the murders that happened Mm -hmm. in, uh, I think it was Arkansas. Um, where goth kids and kids that listen to heavy metal were being accused of being falling under the powers of Satan. And so it's funny because in this article you can read, uh, C.R. Roberts was like, Brian's a good kid. He doesn't drink. He doesn't listen to heavy metal. Right. He doesn't play Dungeons and Dragons. He's not into drugs. This is um, not Satan latching is, his Yeah, claws this isn't a uh, satanic influence here. This is a kid who is otherwise just a good student and uh, a nice kid, and uh, he encountered something that he could could not explain. Um, super ripped. Super jacked. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> Hot squad. Well, and it's funny because it com- yeah. this, this comes back uh, years later. In 2009, uh, and this is according to uh, both the Mysterious Universe website and Linda Godfrey's book, American Monsters, 
Two men were hiking on Mount Shasta in Northern California, not too far from Mount, not too far south from Mount St. Helens in Washington State, when they saw something emerge from a cavern in the mountainside and take off into the sky. This creature was covered in dark fur, and the men said, with the body of Hulk Hogan. <laughs> okay. Very specific. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah, brother. <laughs> With the head of a bat Mm -hmm. and a wingspan of an estimated, get ready for this, 50 feet. God. Okay. All right. This bat squatch like entity paid the two friends no heed. It just simply disappeared into the sky, off to hunt whatever it was after. There are reports of other giant man bat creatures in Texas in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Missouri, and even Chicago, <clears throat> where over the past year or two, people have been seeing a dark-winged, man-like bad creature that some were calling the Mothman of Chicago. Uh, we've talked about some of those encounters on this on this very show. Yeah, that's and a that's a great whole thing. One of the most recent ones that we talked about took place in I think southern Wisconsin. A truck driver saw one of these creatures. On the side of the road, look up at him and then fly off into the sky. No mm-hmm. Also, super hot, super ripped. <laughs> More like Randy Macho Man Savage than yeah. a Hulk. I mean, they're pretty. <laughs> I mean, still fuckable. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Whether legend or real, Brian Canfield definitely saw something that night. And while it may not be easily defined or explained, as we've learned again and again on this podcast, it may not be wise to discount it completely. Mm. That is the origin of the Bat Squatch. Bat Squatch. <laughs> Stone, Stone Cold Steve Austin was underrepresented in the Bat Squatch. I know, he really was. <laughs> <laughs> you know that Stone Cold Steve Austin would like pay to fight the Bat Squatch. Yeah, I bet it. He's like, I will pay anyone who can put me in a ring with a bat squatch. I like all these grown men describing this like very muscular. I, I couldn't tear my eyes Jim, away from it. Jim, you see what I saw? Hulk Hogan <laughs> with a bat head and fit foot wings? God damn, that's what Holy I was thinking. Shit. Yeah, it is. There is a sort of undertone of homoeroticism <laughs> yeah. and rampant masculinity in some of these stories. You know? Listen, they have to describe the musculature somehow. Though obviously, the thing was ripped. Listen, you know? he was jacked. Yeah, he jacked. What do you jacked, gonna do? motherfucker. How'd he get so jacked? Yeah. No one knows. We don't know. Flapping well, them fifty foot wings. That's how. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That takes pectoral muscles. <laughs> Dave, I gotta ask you, what the hell was that? That's hard to say. What do you think of these stories? It's strange that so many people. I like like we were saying on the break. It's strange that so many people tell parallel lanes, similar stories. That so many people can have an encounter, not having any understanding of anyone else who's had this encounter, and describe it almost the same way. It's that's sort of. Uh, hard to come to terms with if you're a skeptic. What I find really interesting about this story, too, is, and we kind of skimmed over it, or I did, uh, is that uh, Brian insisted that the fur was blue, was a bright, was like a yeah. soft, bright blue, um, which, you know, immediately makes me think of like the Beast from X Men sure, or something, yeah. which was a cartoon that was popular at that time. Also super hot. Um, also super yeah. jacked, super <laughs> yeah. hot. Um, but. He he stood by that. Now some people think it might have been the the way that the headlights reflected off the fur, but I guess he was interviewed by NBC, a local NBC affiliate, and um, he compared the color of the fur to that of the NBC peacock, the blue peacock. So he kind of was like, it was bright blue. This thing, which is a really fascinating because I none of those many, other none of those other encounters yeah, like reference sat, a blue being well they say yeah i think there was there was there's another encounter of someone who supposedly uh saw the um the creature uh but it seems to be universally decided that it's a hoax so i didn't include it okay um but you can also go in the same area. In the same area, um, it was a it was an it was a hunter who was out one night in the woods, and the story sounded very similar to mm. Brian Canfield's. He encountered a giant blue winged creature that was like half 
man, half bat, kind of with a wolf face. But it, uh, I guess people had done some research into this guy's story, and they were like, "Yeah, we don't really buy it." Um, but he fucked with Brian's truck. Yeah, maybe. So that's the other weird thing Which because is something the other ones that, don't tell a violent, uh, no antagonistic and, story, and that is very common with a lot of paranormal encounters, including UFO encounters, where yeah. the machines just suddenly stop working. Yep. Um, now, the lights didn't go out. The headlights were still working, but the engine stopped. Didn't it say he, he jumped on it and shook it? Well, no. When when he, when he the creature took back oh, off, the turbulence his... of the wings ah, rocked the truck back and forth. I got, you, I got you. And when he landed, it was like a big, loud whoomph and yeah. like kicking a bunch of dust up into the air. Mm. Um but it's a very it's a it's a weird one. I don't know. What do you what do you make of this, Bryce? Um had you heard of the Bat Squatch before? I haven't heard of the Bat Squatch. Um, you know, it's trying to be open minded here. Sure. <laughs> no, I uh listen, you know, I think of like stuff like the Thunderbirds, these giant right. winged creatures that people spot. I uh I don't know. It, it's almost like there's a there's a dimension that exists that houses all kinds of uncanny creatures, whether that's in the mind of the beholder that helps um, crystallize these beings into life. I have no idea, but there seems to be a whole array of, uh, of, of winged creatures now. Um, yeah. You almost like, I mean, maybe it's his interpretation. I, I, I think of the Mothman, honestly, like, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I say sometimes like uh, if it enters into the lexicon and, you can kind of subconsciously creep into your brain without you even acknowledging, and you see something that looks like something, and you reference whatever you have in the catalog yeah. of your mind. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, are you asking me if I think it was a Sasquatch with wings? Um, probably not. I don't know. No, I don't think it is a Sasquatch. And, and in fact, it doesn't really describe him as being a Bigfoot. I think this was a teenage kid yeah. coming up with like... Trying to coin a cool trying name. Trying to co- come up with a cool name for it. Um, I don't think it's related. It's misleading. I That's think all it's I'll probably, say. It's, just, it's misleading. <laughs> I think it, whatever it does this, roll right off the tongue. It does. does. Well yeah, done. I think it's probably Brian. more in line with uh, some of the dogmen-like creatures that... Um, have been seen in Wisconsin and Illinois, or the Mothman. I think it has more in common with that. This, to me, feels interdimensional. Mm -hmm. Um, This feels, to me... You know, um, going back to that idea of, of... does it take the user to help manifest what this thing looks like? You know, we've brought it up on the show before, but like it is all about a glamour, something that is a supernatural being that will look one way to one person and another way Mm -hmm, to another mm -hmm, person, depending mm -hmm. on what the witness finds frightening or what the, you know, and that came up. There was a, I think that was in um, Harry Potter as well. Um, That wasn't it. There was something in a, in a cabinet that the kids Mm -hmm. had to face in the dark arts class. And whatever your worst fear, whatever your worst fear is, it takes that on. So, I think there might be some type of interdimensional or paranormal logic at play here that could that could be that. I don't know. It's a slippery slope. Mm-hmm. Because once you start accepting, unless, and I understand this is why a lot of cryptozoologists are like, nope, Bigfoot is a primate. We're not getting into interdimensional or paranormal shit. It's just an ape in the woods that we have not been able to capture and categorize yet. I get that because... Sometimes you have to draw the line. I used to draw the line at dogmen. There's no such thing. And then you read these stories and you're like, yeah. okay, well, I still don't know if there's such thing as the dogman. Yeah. But these stories are compelling. And these people seem to believe that they saw what they saw just as, just as much as someone who witnessed a UFO in the sky mm-hmm. that I tend to give more, lend more credit to. yeah that's true that's so not it, fair it's, it's a slippery slope so we are, we are on a train that has left the station well, my you, friend no shit dude <laughs> we're you. fucked <laughs> but but it's scary because it's like where do we draw the line and 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 that's why i keep going back to well maybe there's a sliding scale of paranormal entities that we talked about on last week's show and some of them are bigfoot some of them are wolfmen some of them are wolfmen with wings some of them are batmen bat Mans. Some of them are Mothmans. 
they I, I don't know. I don't mm-hmm. know. Maybe it's all bullshit. I, I don't know. But it doesn't it doesn't seem like it. I, I don't know. Yeah. Did you read those accounts from the other parts of the country? I did. Yeah. Um, and a lot some of them look, uh, look more like a five to six foot bat. Oh, OK. You know what I mean? It's a huge um, bat. Like a huge bat or ones that look m- more like the literal, the the villain man bat from Batman. If you ever watched Batman, the yeah, animated yep. series, it was like, they, they kind of look more like that, like a more vampiric bat-like mm-hmm. creature. So they're not even similar to this thing that... Um, that this that this guy uh, that Brian Canfield saw because this one had a, he said had a bit more of a wolf like appearance but didn't have fangs you know it's insane this stuff is crazy and Mothman's supposed to have red eyes <laughs> I know yeah. I'm imagining this very nice human teeth just a nice <laughs> right <laughs> great mouth dental. full of teeth <laughs> no he fangs had a beautiful you're smile beautiful <laughs> <Yeah>. smile <laughs> I'm gonna pull up a picture of of this for you guys but. What? There's a picture? Well, uh, the drawing. No, the interpretation. I, it's, I, I know what you're saying. It's like, you, you know, for me, like the UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena thing, and, and aliens are, are much more grounded in, in, in just the, the plethora of, of witnesses and testimony and, and, right. and even videographic and photographic right, evidence. Right. And as well as like, uh, you know, Bigfoot or Sasquatch, just the, uh, just the amount of eyewitness testimony and then in the physical trace evidence left behind, whether it's in trackways or hair samples or whatever, you know, and then, and then you're right. You get into these, you know, kind of one-offs as I might call it, because, you know, you got this one witness who sees something like you're showing this me This is now. the drawing that Brian Canfield did. We'll put this up on the Instagram. Although that looks like an Anunnaki serpent god. Yeah, so pretty cool. <laughs> maybe, maybe there's something to that. It could have just been that. <clears throat> um, yeah, <laughs> David said he does not want to see that. Yeah, no, that's that's that's. It weird. almost has a head like a bobcat. Yeah, in drawing. It's a strangely small head, and the wings are on on his shoulder blades, not attached to his arms. You yeah, know? nine feet tall, with claws, blue tinted fur, yellowish eyes, sharp. Well, now it says sharp teeth and tufted ears, but I don't know. Pretty. Well, I'm not going to be the guy that calls. Maybe him a he liar. said it doesn't have fangs like. Here's here's another artist interpretation. The other thing is these aren't stories, you know, told I when you mentioned Chupacabra earlier, I feel like I've always heard that one mentioned yeah. with like a sort of scary looming ghost story kind of vibe. Right. These are just encounters. It's not like someone saying, "Watch out for this thing it lurks in the woods." Totally. It's right. going to come grab you out of the dead of night. It's right. Just, I saw this thing came what out of nowhere. Happened? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they talk about in uh I'm reading that uh The Life and Times of Bigfoot book which is written from a very skeptical point of view. Uh it's authors I think Jason Blubus. Um might be getting that wrong off the top of my head, but he talks about in the turn of the century how uh, these encounters with Yeti and Sasquatch, especially with the, in the Himalayas, when Yeti became popularized by uh, explorers hiking Mount Everest and started hearing local stories mm. of like yak mm-hmm. herders and this entity that they would see. He, he said that there there was something that sort of happened, and David, you're totally on to something where. Up until the turn of the of the twentieth century, a lot of these stories of boogeymen and stuff had much more of a ghost story narrative. Mm-hmm. And what's what made the Yeti and Sasquatch and a lot of these stories we're now hearing the Beast of Bray Road stuff in the twentieth and now twenty first century sound so convincing is they are sort of these innocuous like uh just encounters that seem to this thing crosses the road and you see it or right. you catch a glam glimpse of it it didn't threaten it's me not, it didn't try yeah, and hurt it's, me it's not it was, haunting your house ha- i mean we right. still have obviously sure, stories yeah. of ghosts that haunt and stuff like that or ufo abductions that are a little bit more involved but a lot of these sasquatch it's it's like catching the glimpse of an animal in the wild right right and that's it um, and that adds to um, the believability of the story, uh, you know, whether true or not. Um, but uh, it's that was sort of a new phenomena in folklore. These stories of like, I just happened to see this thing pass by. I feel a little ashamed because when we were playing Believe It or Bullshit, I 
every land dwelling figure that you mentioned, <laughs> like Bigfoot, Chupacabra, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeti, mm-hmm. I called bullshit. Mm. The Loch Ness Monster. You're an air guy. I called believe it. Because I think the deep of the sea is so wildly unknown. I can imagine something existing down there that, I mean, of course, there are billions of things that exist down there that we've never even imagined. And it seems less possible that that would happen on land, but there's so much uninhabited land. Of course, things could exist without us seeing them. Especially still here on the West Coast. And, um, you know, we really only... uh, populated the the west coast and california i mean you know within the last 200 years yeah centuries um two centuries. and if you go down the rabbit hole that we've been going down some of these entities might slip into other dimensions which right. makes them even harder right. to find exactly yeah i forget uh the guy who said i believe he was like a french astronomer but he's quoted as saying you know the universe isn't stranger than you can imagine the universe is stranger than you can imagine um, right. We live in a we live right. in a strange, strange place, and so when you get these kind of uh, creatures that that people come across, you know, it doesn't surprise me that it's blue with nice right. yeah. teeth. Right. You imagine eyes. things in the image of your of your narrative of how you perceive things, and sure. of course, things can exist in a way that you can't even totally. And I don't and think surprises. this thing came out of that volcano, but. I like that culturally, folklore is oh, this really bad thing Catastrophic happened, event. and as a result, yeah, the it bridge gave falling birth to mm. this monster. I did some research into uh, some uh, some bodies of Bigfoot being uh, discovered after that uh, Mount Shasta explosion. Oh yeah, that was that's a hoax. Well, <laughs> no, it is. Well, now wait a minute, I, Mike, moving on. No, I think they prove that. I think that story's a proven hoax. We could go on Snopes and it'd be like, no, no, no. No, yeah, totally. But uh, it um, there's some interesting uh, story elements to it. I mean, you know, if, I mean, yeah, a, a, and a quarter of a mountain was blown off the the face of the earth. You know, of course, yeah. If there's gonna be Bigfoots Mount up Saint there, Hollins. maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I I know that story. But then it was like the guy who was behind that was proven to. That he was lying, okay, idiot. I'm not from, yeah, I'm not well, we can look that. it up. Right, yeah, yeah, that we'll was check it out because uh, I, I've, I wanted, uh, and then it was like, oh no, 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 everybody says this is bullshit. So, well, it's good to have standards, you know. <laughs> I guess <laughs> draw the line somewhere. We can gotta right. draw the line somewhere. <laughs> we can certainly tell the story, but then if we do, we gotta unpack. The Listen, I, I only hoaxery. came across it on a YouTube thing. I found it interesting. Well, there so. you go. There you go. I mean, there's so many hoaxers that have said they've co- found Bigfoot bodies and they've all been proven. Oh, yeah. No, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Anywho. David, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank I hope you, you had a good time. Pleasure. Oh, my God. I had a blast. I hope awesome. you'll think about the universe a little differently once you <laughs> exit the clubhouse Or mermaids. Today. If yeah. you could just rethink mermaids <laughs> Yeah, a you bit. guys are hung up on the mermaid thing. The ocean is vast. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't have that. any reason to disbelieve it. You asked me, gun to my head. <laughs> yeah. What do you say? Uh, David, where can people find you should you wish to be found? Oh, uh, what do you mean? Like oh. social media? Oh, yeah, uh, I'm on Instagram, uh, David Hall, David Hall, just my mm-hmm. name twice. And, Ooh. uh, what can we expect from your character White Josh this season on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, uh, premiering October 12th on The CW? Yeah, uh, more of the same, a lot more of sardonic, quippy one-liners oh, from our boy Y. Joe. Right. I will tease that we have our first scene together, ever. That's true. Maybe two. I think we're in two scenes this year. What do you mean? Mm-hmm. One we haven't shot yet? Or did we shoot two? Mm, we'll talk off off mic. There's one I think we forgot about. Oh. oh there's oh. one that I sh- really... It's weird that my character's there. <laughs> but Well, there's one that's weird that your character's there that it's even weirder that my character's not there. Oh, that's the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> you should have been there and I'm not. But, oh well. Uh... <laughs> That's the way it goes. Uh, Played your cards right that week, my (laughs) friend. (laughs) I think it has more to do with budget than anything else, I'm sure. Um, Anyway, uh, uh, and then The Body. The Body. It came out last week on Hulu. It's there for the watching. Is all all of it out? It's just, it's an anthology series, so it's just, uh, each chapter is self-contained. Okay. So I'm just in the first. They're releasing one a month. uh, There you go. For the first Friday of every month. The Year of Fear, they're calling it. Oh. Horror movies, feature-length horror movie, one a month that uh, deals with the corresponding holiday. Oh, awesome. cool. So oh, ours is about Halloween. The next one will be about Thanksgiving, and so on and so forth. Are they all called The Body? 
No, The Body is the first installment. The whole series is called Into the Dark. Okay. Love that. that. Cool. Got it, got it, got it. I just mm-hmm. blew out the mic on that mm-hmm. one. All right. Uh, Riley, anything to plug coming up? I just want to plug that phone number one more time. Hell yeah, get that phone number out there. Hell yeah, bro. 597 4803. Leave us a message. We'll play it on the yeah, air. Yeah, if you see something strange, give us a holler. Bryce, Hell anything? Yeah. yeah uh, as you heard, we uh, we shared with you one of our listener files. So please feel free to write into our Gmail account, Bigfoot Collectors Club at gmail.com. Tell us your supernatural stories, and uh, perhaps we might share them on one of our podcasts. Make right. up for guests who have none. Yes. yes. <laughs> and have no business being on this no. podcast. No. Hey, they're coming. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Jared for plugging my new comic book adventure van uh, available now. <laughs> Uh, you can get what issues one and two are already out. Issue three will be out around the time this drops. And then issues four and five come in November and December. Nice. Go uh, buy Golden Apple Books. Go tell your uh, your 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 uh, local comic shop to order it, please. Or get it on the Comixology app. Okay, guys. <laughs> that's it for this week. We'll be back again next week with more tales of high strangeness and amazing personal paranormal histories. We love you guys. David, you want to send us out? Yes, goodbye. Perfect. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> That's what y'all. Bigfoot Collectors Club is produced by Riley Bray. Our theme song is Come Alone by Sun Eaters, courtesy of Lotus Pool Records. If you like the show, please rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps get the podcast to more listeners. To support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club and unlock multiple reward episodes every month.